Hey guys, welcome back to the Great Deconstruction Podcast. Uh, this is going to be known as Season 2. Uh, I kind of had to take a hiatus for a while because of a lot of trouble with our internet connection here at my house uh, that kind of persisted through the summer and it seems to be fixed now. I think we're all better. Uh, today I have the great pleasure of talking to my good friend Hayne Griffin uh, from Asheville, North Carolina. He is uh, a brilliant, kind, loving man, and uh, I'm honored to know him and to know his story and, and to see the impact he has on the world that he's part of. Um, uh, Hayne's a, a, just a, a great guy. We've known each other for three or four years now and met through another podcast called Pastor With No Answers. You can go listen to that and hear one or both of us talking pretty often. Um, and, and Haynes here telling his story about how he grew up, and what he believed and how much that's changed over the, the last several years. I think you'll get a lot out of it. And I hope, uh, I hope you learned something today. Uh, we've got a lot of cool stuff coming up on the next season. We've got three or four already lined up to record. So, uh, yeah, look forward to it and get ready for season two. Gotcha. Um, I am joined by Hayne Griffin. Is it Griffin? Yeah, you got it. Griffin. Griffith? Yeah. Griffin, Griffin, I am. Okay, yep. I forget. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've known each other a couple years, maybe 2020, 2021. Yeah, right around there. Through That's Joey. Yep. Yep, the Joey yeah. Svensson. Wow. Through Joey Svensson, the Joey Svensson of the Pastor With No Answers podcast, which we're both co-hosts on. And Hayne is a brilliant guy and kind oh. and gentle and very funny. <laughs> and I enjoy uh, listening to Hayne more than anybody uh, because he'll. Oh, man. Uh, Hayne is making a, me blush a, now. A, no, I'm serious. You will stop and think before you speak. And that is a lost art. Hmm. You, you really absorb what people are saying hmm. and you listen to them hmm. before you respond. And I don't see you. I never see you in your head trying to think of a response. Oh, wow. I yeah. always see you listening. And that's a good, that's a wonderful thing. And I can tell that you've got a lot of experience in just listening. Well, thank you so much. I would say the same, literally the same thing about you. So I really appreciate, you know, you saying that. So thanks, brother. Well, yeah. So tell, tell everybody who you are. You're like a superhero firefighter. <laughs> uh, union leader, I just found out. Yeah. So yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. Tell us about everything that is is you today and then we'll start talking about back in the day sounds great yeah me today so um mid i'm in my mid 40s i have been a professional firefighter that's what everybody kind of gets drawn to is when they find out that i'm a professional firefighter they want to talk about that and hear about that so i've been doing that and you've been on the calendars at least once right uh, yeah sure <laughs> no okay. i've never been on a calendar you, um those uh really i thought you had oh shoot no i hadn't been on a calendar um uh we haven't done one since my tenure there but there was one done a few years before i was there yeah. and then it, got, it took just such public criticism that they never did another one but ah, um, that sucks yeah yeah but um, yeah, I've been I've worked as a professional firefighter for 15 years. Um, I work for the city of Asheville, North Carolina, which is a really unique city. Um, it's it's the largest city on our side of the state. So it's around 100,000 people. It's not very big, but because it is the largest city, because the major hospitals are there, and then major businesses like the Biltmore Estate. A lot of people know about the Biltmore House. And then just all the industry that's there. Yeah, a lot of people go vacation over there. Tons. So between the tourism and then just so many folks that live outside the city that come into work, the city usually swells and, and just buzzes around a quarter of a million people almost all the time. But um, over half the people that are in it aren't, you know, they don't, they do not pay taxes. They're not property owners in the oh. city, which is kind of interesting. So, um, and a lot of people know Asheville because it's this kind of this outdoor hub and that's what drew us to it. Um, I'm a big, I love the mm -hmm. mountains, um, big climber, love to rock climb, love to hike. My wife's the same, um, married, have two children. I have a daughter that's 16 and a son that's 14 <clears throat> and they're just super fun, super cool people. I love this stage right now of being a dad. I was not a baby guy. Honestly, I hated being the parent of a baby. Uh, it was like having a pet turtle <laughs> and I didn't like it. 
Oh yeah. my! <laughs> it's just something that shits and eats, and you just feed it. Um, yeah. And I felt really, really, you know, bad. You know, I felt uh, even some sense, I guess, shame because all, all my friends at the time were like, "Oh, I just love being a parent." And I was like, "Fuck, I don't like this." Is they're just lying? Yeah, it's it's um, this is taking a huge hit on on my playtime. <laughs> it's super selfish to say that, but it's true. If I'm being yeah. honest. Um, but I love this age. Obviously, you know, the kids, they come out of, of that and they develop their personalities. And you begin to love them. And, and I loved them. I mean, I can say this. I loved them instantly, but I really didn't like them um, until yeah. they got, you know, about a year or two years under their, under the, you know. I, it sounds to me like uh, what whenever a stray dog shows up in my yeah. yard. Right. Uh, so this sounds even worse. <laughs> come on, bring it. <laughs> uh, but. But like eventually, like two or three days in, like it's my fucking dog now. Right. So I got to start to find reasons to yeah, like it. Yeah. You know oh, what I mean? Absolutely. Like that happens a lot. Yeah. Every, yeah. Absolutely. So <laughs> that's that. I appreciate your honesty there because parents don't don't tell that truth often. No, enough. I think they're afraid to. And you know, you, you know me well enough now. I will say whatever you know is is true. Yeah. Um, for me, so uh, in my experience, because um, I think there's so many people that feel the same way. Uh, hopefully, you know, someone's hearing this, they're like, yeah, I, I really hated being the parent of an infant. It's, uh, um, and just having to deal with my own selfishness and how I just wanted to be in control of, to have that responsibility was really a difficult transition for me. The kids now are 14, they're 16. And I love, I know a lot of people hate this time because of the hormones and the teenage years. And I love it. I love the conversations we have. I mean, we're talking about everything from, sexuality to politics to what does it mean to just be a good person what does it mean to be kind rather than right what does it mean to yeah. navigate this world and man i i love it i really i get so much life out of it my kids are so cool um and they may have the wool pulled over our eyes um i don't i don't think so i mean i know they do teenage bullshit yeah. like they hide from us that's normal. i think this generation is brilliant i really I think that they are heavily under us yes. and i thought that about the previous generation too and i still do but this this next one is going through has gone through hell mm -hmm. they're inheriting just the, the absolute worst version of the earth that we possibly Agreed. could yep and and somehow their humor <laughs> <laughs> is beyond the pale. Oh, yeah. It's like the darkest, yeah. That's my son. <laughs> most disgusting humor. I love oh, yeah. it. I, it's hilarious. They are the funniest mm -hmm. people and somehow uh, can communicate ideas that are very radical. Yeah. I, I, I think that these, this generation has a political uh, leaning that is going to surprise yep. us in a very good yep. way. I posted a meme several years ago uh, about. Uh, Gen Z uh, taking me off uh, because I'm not socialist enough and shoot me <laughs> because I'm just not quite commie enough and I'm <laughs> as communist as they get because they're just so cool, right. you know. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, um, that's so cool. What are, what are your kids like politically? What are their political thoughts like? I'm curious about. That. So they are. So yeah, they're at that age where there's there's still so much of their ideology is shaped by me. And shaped by Erica, my yeah. wife. Um, so we we have had to become really careful about some of the things that we say because they'll just embody it because they trust us. And I want them to start thinking for themselves. They're beginning to. My, you know. So just for the listener, where I'm at politically, I'm I'm definitely left of center and um, very intrigued and drawn towards socialist democracies. Um, you would be more communist than I am. But, um, but I, what the current path that we're on, um, is cancerous. It's just a slow, it's a slow cancer. Yeah. It's just killing society. And, and not that we have to get deep into that. So but my, our, our kids here say things and with everything happening, politically ramping up, you know, my son made a comment, maybe this was two weeks ago, just kind of bashing Trump. And, and I said, well, well, why do you think that? Like, where did you hear that? And he said, well, I, yeah. you know, I heard it at somebody in my school. And I said, would you believe that? And he said, well, yeah, I guess. And I said, well, why do you believe it? And he said, well, I don't, I don't know. I just, it just sounded right. And I said, well, hey, I think it'd be good to do some research. You know, just, I'm not a Trump supporter, 
But if you if you're gonna dog the guy, know why. You know, if, if you're gonna be critical, have, yeah, have some some backing. So, um, so our kids, they're they're developing that on their own right now, which is kind of cool. Um, they are spiritually, it's it's just interesting where they're at. Um, I think because. Uh, where I've evolved and where Erica has evolved, uh, there's there are definitely people of faith, and they're involved in the local church that we really don't go to. Um, they're involved with uh, Young Life. That's a really big uh, uh, kind of parachurch ministry. Yeah, yep, and the school. And um, and honestly, what I love about it is is it, it it is surrounding them with some really just good kids. I mean, kids that are yeah. at least moral kids, which I appreciate. Um, but what I love about my kids too, is they, they're very, so they're very liberal socially, very progressive socially and, and have good reason why. And, and I love my daughter. She is just a fireball and I love her coming back from youth group and, and telling us, yeah, so-and-so said something that was really derogatory against the trans community, really derogatory against the gay community. And, and even said, you know, the Bible says, and she just pushes back. She's like, that's not true. And they're like, well, well and yeah. then she'll push back on the on her friends, and and I love that about them. So my kids are, they're wonderful. We spend a lot of time with them. I just think, I mean, this talking about dogs, but <laughs> you know, I have a firm belief about just pets and animals that great dogs are animals or cats or any animal, any pet in the home is an animal that's had a lot of time spent with it, you know, developing relationship. I'm not trying yeah. to liken my children to pets. That's not what I'm saying. But we we really value, put a high, high value on time and spending a lot of time with our kids to the point, actually, where, and this kind of unpacks a little bit more of just kind of who I am right now. But um, you know, Eric and I, we live, we live very simply. We live in a very small home. We downsized in 2013, which I'm sure will come out some in our conversation later. But we were kind of on this trajectory of just living that normal American life and um experienced some significant suffering in life and i was like okay it was just a hard reset for our minds to say what do we really value and one of the biggest things we valued was time and time together so we downsized considerably. we did the opposite of kind of what a lot of our friends were doing and we decided you know what we're going to live real small so we can travel and experience real big and have big time big yeah. time uh, have more time together so that's how we've chosen to live and um and i think my kids where they're at I mean, again, I could be totally wrong. I might mean, be totally uh, blinded. I don't think so. Yeah. But they're they're really good kids. They're good people. Um, so yeah, we're doing the teenage thing right now. I work for the Asheville Fire Department. We have a very robust labor union. Uh, North Carolina is a right to work state, so that does give us um, yeah. that, that uh, handcuffs us a bit and some of the things that we can get done. But we're very large. Ninety percent of our membership are, are unionized. And um, I'm in a leadership role with that. And I just, I love advocating for the little guy. I love advocating for the guys in the trenches. And um, that's kind of oh, yeah. where I'm at. I mean, me too. I, I actually tried to unionize multiple workplaces, but it is super anti-union down here. Oh, I'm people sure. People thought I was crazy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, uh, and, and people, like the thing is the management knew but they were so not worried about it. They never even brought it up. It was just like, yeah, hey, whatever. He's, he'll never do it. So, oh my gosh. <laughs> so it, yeah. Surprise. And it, 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 it didn't happen. So, uh, yeah, we just couldn't get it. We couldn't get it to happen. Yeah. It's, there's a lot of propaganda about it. There is. And people there's believe it. My mom, I remember her, uh, voting on union, uh, at one of her jobs, which would have been life changing for us, for yep. me. And she voted against. Oh man! Uh, it would have changed our lives, yeah, yeah. overnight probably yeah. because her income would have increased so much. But absolutely, the propaganda won. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, so you'll find this interesting, and I think you'll appreciate this story. Um, similarly, you know, growing up, I grew up in upstate South Carolina in a conservative home, great home, but very conservative. And I all the propaganda like with unions, I, I had heard all the bullshit. And I'm not saying that any organization's perfect; they're not. Um, but, no, no. but I had heard, you know, all the things almost, almost demonized, you know, um, but I've always tried to keep an open mind when I was hired, I went in to sign my paperwork. This was 2008, I believe when I signed my paperwork and 
uh, the city gives their whole spiel. Somebody from HR comes in and gives a whole spiel. And they put the papers in front of you and you sign your papers. It's like, okay, you're officially employed. Um, but then the union came in, a couple, two, two union representatives, just to explain to us a union and, and everything about it. So they came in, gave an excellent spiel about who they are, what they do. I was a little you know, energized by it. I was like, wow, this sounds really good. But there was a guy sitting beside me who had, he was from the area, but he had worked for Washington, D.C. fire. So he was a D.C. firefighter for seven years prior, was just moving closer to home. Um, and I looked at Aaron, and I knew he was experienced. And I just said, because I was curious, you know, was he was he in the union originally? Because we're we're a large organization, we're unionized, but we're also a part of an international. Um, our we just have yeah. our local. So I looked at, <clears throat> at Aaron, and I said, Aaron, were you in the union in D.C.? And he looked at me and said, Oh hell yeah, I mean just like that. And I said, Oh, that's that was a pretty robust, quick answer. I, I like that. I said, Why? And he said, Real simple, bro. He said, local government will do everything in their power to fuck you. And the union stands in the gap. Yep. And when yep. he said that, I was like, you show me where to sign my name. That sounds great to me. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're broke. Local governments are so broke right now. Totally. So they can't. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And that, ours yeah, is, that's what we're dealing yeah, with. It's right falling now. apart. Yeah. And we're a very tourism, a tourism driven economy, which is good because a lot of people are traveling. But what happened post COVID here, real estate prices over doubled. And it's just created a huge inequality. This is, this is the fight we're in right now. Huge inequality for particularly our youngest guys. They can't afford to live yeah. here. They're all moving an hour, hour and a half out because they can't. They, the housing costs are too high, and the pace too meager. So we're we're, we're really in a robust dialogue and a good dialogue. City council has been wonderful to us. Just yeah. to hear us out. And That's good. So, yeah. Yeah. So tell me about your your growing up your experience in life uh, as a kid the good the bad the ugly whatever you're willing to yeah. share and kind of weave in the religious picture the tapestry there yeah. absolutely born and raised in a southern conservative middle class home so i am your i am your quintessential white southern male truly um as far as where i where i started i will also say this <clears throat> and um, and I know a lot of people can't say this. My, my childhood was not perfect, but one of the adjectives I use for my childhood is in, at some measure, it was very enchanted. Um, and, uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, two parents who still deeply love each other. My dad's 77. My mom is 74. They've been married for 40 something years. My mom is currently going through some horrible dementia stuff. And my dad is more committed and more loving her than he's ever been. Um, it's a, it's an wow. a marriage that has evolved a relationship that's evolved. Um, though we grew up and were raised in a Baptist Southern Baptist context, my parents, even though they were and are, although my mom's a closet liberal, I tell her that all the time. I can't, She's at a place in her mind right now where she just can't, she, she has a hard time remembering what month of the year it is. But I used to always say, mom, you're yeah. My mom, by the way, is also dealing with dementia oh, uh, man. early onset right I'm now. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's rough. It is rough. I, and I, we're not, we don't live close. Yeah. So there's a lot of worry. Oh yeah. I'm, so. I'm, yeah, I totally feel that space and they live an hour and a half from me and my wife, which I'm sure is going to come out later as well. You know, the last three years has been fighting and battling and doing really well with the battle against breast cancer. But that took so much of our emotional space, time, and energy that my sister's been the one that's really led the charge with helping my mom. But um, anyway, I call my, tell my mom all the time, even, you know, pre the, the mental decline, you, you are a closet liberal. You, you do, your orthopraxy does not match your orthodoxy at all. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so even growing up in that context, I mean, my parents disagreed on a lot of stuff, even on the Bible. My mom took a more progressive stance with it. Um, but I feel like because she grew up in Piedmont of North Carolina, kind of small town, North Carolina, there was a certain social air, social way she just kind of had to be because she was raised in the 50s and 60s. Um, so she was this interesting mix. And my dad as, as well. For example, and I, I know we had this conversation maybe a year and a half ago, but you know, I grew up in the in the whole Southern Baptist purity culture. My parents 
they never said, you know, that's bullshit, but they never lived that way. Um, and, and I had this sexual ethic at home that was so different than the sexual ethic I was being preached, you know. Um, theirs was just, you know, my, my mom did too. That's yeah. funny. Yeah. She was very liberal with yeah. that. And she was a heathen when I was growing right. up, really. Uh, and she didn't become a Christian until I left the faith. Oh, wow. Um, but I grew up, she was, you know, kind of slutty and doing stuff that I wouldn't have done. God, I got to <laughs> cut this out in case. Shit. <laughs> I have to cut that out. You're good. Uh, crap. Yeah. So she was just partying and stuff like sure. that. Stuff that I would have never done and still won't do because I'm just not into right, it. Right. your thing. Um, yeah, we were, we we're just kind of opposites in, in that way. But she. Uh, she did give me a very liberal view of sexuality that I had a hard time swallowing. It yeah. was like, no, you're wrong. Yeah. I'm, you know, virgin yeah. for life if I have to be. Yeah. So uh, that's interesting anyway. Sorry. No, to you're good. You're abs- that's, I love that. And, and, and for my parents, they, they were, they were still very conservative, particularly my father and still is, but he was, he, he was, always about context and even though he would have a conservative yeah. bent nothing to him was really ever black and white like yeah the the stove and oven that's black and white traffic lights that's black and white but when we get into issues of politics sexuality uh, religion spiritual all those things he goes those are just gray areas and we can and we just have to be honest about that and and I loved that. Yeah. It was so cool to grow up in that home um, with that, even though on Sundays and Wednesday nights, I was getting you know fed one thing, but, but I just had a, a home life and parents that spent a lot of time with us, um, camping, traveling, uh, just, it was just normal to sit at the table and have dinner together and play cards and just shoot the shit. Um, so, and that's yeah. what I mean by enchanted. It was, it was enchanted and um, because they were just so, emotionally and physically available to us and loved us. My sister, I have a sister that's younger than I am. Um, so well. Yeah. So that was my childhood. Um, I was never pressured at all growing up to go to church. It was, it was Sundays weren't optional because I was a little kid and they couldn't leave me at home alone. Um, right. My sister wanted to go on Wednesday nights. I didn't. And they were fine with that. Um, so a parent would stay home. One would take my sister to church. Never any pressure ever to make a decision. I never felt like religion that they ever forced it down my throat. Uh, when I was a teenager, I developed a relationship, a, a good friendship um, with a buddy. We kind of started a garage band together. Uh, Philip uh, was a very outspoken Pentecostal Christian and a hell of a drummer. Oh, a hell of a drummer. And okay. all I knew was this guy plays drums and I just love being a band with him. He can wail. And just through that relationship, he kind of got me interested in things of faith. I was 16 years old and that's kind of when I decided I was going to make a, like a profession of faith and did. Okay. 16 years old. You're in a, a garage band. Yeah. What, what are the, I know you probably had 10 different names. What were, give me a few of the best names. The, the band, band names. Uh, yeah. God. Surely you had some good ones. So I'm trying to think, uh, I've been in a couple of different bands and you'll appreciate it since you're in the band name. That band's and that band's name was maybe we called ourselves Two Houses, which is stupid. That was a dumb name. Oh, that sucks. I remember I at one point we were called Cornerstone and then we changed our name okay. to Johnny Ringo. Which was uh Okay, that's kind of a good yeah, name. Yeah, Johnny Ringo was cool. Johnny Ringo. Uh we had a buddy um in a later band in college that he really wanted to name the band cup full of nipples, which I thought was amazing. Um, yeah. And then we had, we had a roommate in college. His name was Paul Jenkins, which I thought was the coolest name ever. Like, God, Paul Jenkins is such a cool name. So I wanted to, I wanted to name the band, the Paul Jenkins band, although Paul wasn't in the band. Um, right. I love that. That's actually, yeah, better. I agree. So Paul's not in the band, call ourselves the Paul Jenkins band. And whenever we played like, like real local shows, Paul would be there sitting, sitting in a recliner on stage drinking while we were jamming. Like I just thought that'd be the best. Oh, I love yeah. that. So, um, yeah, I think that band's name back in the day, that, that, that first band, it was something really goofy. It's Cornerstone or Johnny Ringo or something. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you for entertaining. Yeah, that. always, man, always. <laughs> A friend of mine has a kid. It's probably 16, 17 now, but a few years ago, he started a little band with like, like 12, 13 year old friends Yeah, and they call themselves the doo-doo babies. And I loved it. <laughs> I made them a little logo and everything. I love it. I love it. I really wanted yeah. to the band Dune, which I know you and I have talked about the film. Hell yeah. But I was really into the books big time. And I remember yeah. really wanting to name the band Dune after the books, but nobody was into it. Yeah, so. they're good. I I was impressed. I, I went through them last summer. Yeah. Good stuff. Brilliant. Brilliant stuff. So, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a closet sci-fi geek. So, um, yeah, I after probably read those three or four times. So, yeah. Really? Wow. So that's, that's, so yeah, going back to my story, like 16 years old, kind of made that profession of faith and man, I, I dove in that like deep in all in, um, jumped in, uh, because I was a musician, started doing the praise and worship thing it's at church. Um, thought, oh man, you know, I want to go to a Christian university. I just, I just wanted to soak up and surround myself with as many people's faith as I possibly could. I was eager to learn, and I was, you know, I was very impressionable. Like any anything that I heard that had any type of Jesus. Uh, label sticker and i was immediately in and then though i grew up in a baptist context um when i went on to college i went to a small baptist school actually in alabama um sanford university go bulldogs they were in the in march yeah. madness this year i i, I know yeah. sanford i i think i have some friends that graduated yeah, from there yeah it's, it was a great place I've seen the bulldog on some shirts oh, yeah. around here. Yeah, it's, the school's kind of growing. It's growing quite a bit now. But um, I was just really fortunate. I got a, a significant scholarship uh, to go down there and went down there. Almost transferred out because it was a little too deep south for me. You know, even growing up really? in South Carolina, which is definitely southern, um, it was just it was a deep south to me that I just was – Christianity was so ingrained into the fabric um, yeah. of everyone. And I, I don't like bullshit. I don't like anything that's disgenuine. I remember just struggling. It was a, this, at the school, it was, you know, the Greek system was huge. And I learned really early on that when the sorority showed up on Sundays for lunch in the cafeteria, they were all expected to dress like they had gone to church, whether they did or didn't. It was the air of that. And oh. that was a, for a young 18 year old kid that was just hell bent on Jesus and hell bent on things being authentic and real. It, it just kind of sent me over the edge. But I had such great relationships and good friendships there. I just remained and I did all four years there and graduated. While I was there, I got exposed to Calvinism and got involved yeah. in a uh, Presbyterian Church of America, PCA church. Oof. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um Jeez, Scott. Oh man. I told you I went I got deep. <laughs> I mean I got deep, Matt. I so I've had a few debates with PCAs. Boy, they are. <laughs> Congratulations. So, I mean, yeah. you want to talk about jerks. Brutal. Can, I mean brutal. people that can be brutal. Yeah. Funny. Oh brutal. yeah, hilarious. Yes. I've got a bunch of them on my Facebook yep. that I'll occasionally fuck around yeah. with. Oh uh, yeah. But I you really don't want to tangle up with them because they're good. They're very good. They're good at arguing. They have very definitive points and they believe so zealously and fervently in that. Um, well, they have no other choice. Have no other choice. Exactly. I mean, it's such, it's such a mind job if we're being you yeah, know, man. honest. I got really into understanding the Vantillian thing, which is mm -hmm. part a big part of what the PCA kind of uses as their defense now yeah. they are uh it's it is the most contradictory self-referential thing i've ever seen mm -hmm. and you cannot show it to them right yeah <laughs> because then you're doing the same right. thing it's just impossible yep, yep. so it, it's a very convenient uh argument because it is impossible to do anything with other than just say it's ludicrous it is <laughs> and that faith and theology that that group marries itself perfectly into the culture of middle upper class white males. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, who believe down. I mean, you grew up in a place of extreme privilege. So when you get mm -hmm. when you hear a theology like that, it's like, hell yeah, that completely 
um, mirrors how, how I have grown up my entire life. That must be true. That has to be true. Yeah. Um, and it's why you see very few um, people, minorities in those churches. Um, just very, very few. And those churches only are very rich, only the elect. And if your entire um, experience of the world has been, you were literally culturally elect <laughs> by, by the previous system, by the, how things have historically played out, particularly in this country. And of course, that theology makes great sense. So, yeah, and it's the thing is, it's a very small. It's not a very huge small. group. Yeah. So, but they ha- they have an incredible amount of political influence. They do uh, nationally and in the communities. There, they're, they're very influential people and a lot of money. For me, it's a cult. And the the, the Christian nationalism. Oh boy, a lot. Of, you can find some roots in there. Yeah. I can assure you of yeah, that. You sure can. Um, you sure can. Yeah. So it's a. Uh, it is for me, and I, I know if anyone is PCA or is at least listening to this or is connected into some of that, it, this may offend you. Offend them. I don't want to offend you, but it just feels very yeah. cultish to me. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah so I, I kind of took a deep dive into that. Um, and towards my senior year, I became kind of suspect of it. And a lot of that was because of my father. Um, even though my, yeah. da- my dad him. is, uh, you know, Definitely uh, an errant infallibility guy, very conservative in how he interacts with the scriptures. He really pushed back. Uh, I remember you're going to laugh at this coming home, like for Christmas holiday, maybe I was a sophomore, and and I told him. (laughs) Uh, By the way, I also need to throw this out there about my father. My father is a New Testament theologian, like has a doctorate. So he's he's pretty pretty yeah he's 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 deeply. Uh, versed in the scriptures. I came home, I announced to him, I literally walked in the door with my PCA chip on my shoulder and my you know, Calvinist you know, thinking. And we were just out in the yard doing some work. I grew up on a farm. I did a lot of stuff outdoors. And I just said, hey, um, I finally understand election. I get it. And my dad was like, really? And I said, yeah. <clears throat> and he said, let's come in, let's go inside real quick. So we go inside. He pulls out a legal pad. Sits at the kitchen table, <laughs> pulls out a pen, and goes start talking because I don't get it at all. Oh, I love your dad, Dog. Okay. And uh, that's he's, wonderful. He's, he's a Perfect. beautiful man. He's an amazing man. And in that Gosh. moment, I was like, "Oh my lord!" I, what a perfect way to tell a child was, that something so profound, so so profound. <laughs> and it was just one of those immediate moments of, "Oh, whoa!" Like this man who I yeah. deeply respect, who knows way more than any of these college seniors and recent college graduates that are feeding me all these lines. Yeah. It was just a beautiful way. And it wasn't passive aggressive. It was, it was just beautiful to, yeah, to without, I mean, you describe it as a genuine thing. It was, it it was. Um, and there were so (laughs) many things that I got, I could just, you know, a whole podcast on my dad's parenting skills. Um, yeah, that sounds amazing. he's, He's a, he's a cool guy. So anyway, I think that was the beginning of that. Um, that container, I talk a lot about spiritual containers um, in my life, and that container that was kind of built, that was very short-lived. My dad was the first to take a uh, a little hammer and go, pink, and it cracked. Yeah. And that crack grew yeah. really quick, um, to the point that by my senior year, I just wasn't really involved anymore. I kind of pulled out. I wasn't, by any stretch, I just wasn't Calvinist anymore. I, I by no means was walking away from faith. Uh, at all but uh yeah i was like okay this is a this is a, a flavor of of christianity that i just think silly and 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 damaging so i started to walk away from it yeah um took a job right out of there and in, in um uh, not in retail but in manufacturing i worked for an outdoor uh, manufacturer out they manufactured outdoor clothing spent a year on the road basically just selling outdoor gear because of my background and just outdoor adventure, I got a, a job with these guys. That was 2001, and that's right when 9/11 happened. And it, that uh, that uh, that whole shoot, we're trying not, not the, well, the economy definitely took a hit, but that entire niche um, retail world of out outdoor these are just, you know this yeah. is uh, hobby. It's just a hobbyist niche. Uh, it tanked. Everybody was so concerned about the really? economy. Yeah. I mean, 
If you weren't wow. selling Columbia, uh, North Face, Patagonia, you weren't going to make it. Um, so I just, I wasn't making any money. I was on the road all the time. I was getting pretty lonely and came out of that, had some buddies that, um, lived in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, in Gwinnett County, which is just, uh, just North of the city. And they were young life guys, uh, which is a parachurch organization that works with high school students. And they offered me a job to go on staff with young life. So I just needed something different. I was like, yeah, I'll do it. I moved to Atlanta for two years and did the Young Life thing. And that was really important in terms of my spiritual development because our young, the Young Life director was this person that embraced the person of Jesus, embraced what he would say were certain tenets of the faith, but everything else to him was gray. It was, I don't know. And I really appreciate, maybe, I don't know if he would say this about himself, but I would say maybe the first Christian agnostic I'd ever met, you know, someone that wow. yeah. um, was just willing to say, I do not know about all of these things and that's okay. And I don't need to know. And uh, so he was a real mentor. I was also connected to a local church and there was some abusive things in the church going on. Um, very, very subtle but enough that I felt like I, I can't do this ministry thing. This is not my jam and pulled out of that. I took a job building houses for a year, which is probably the greatest education I ever got, Matt. Yeah. I bet. Just swinging. A, I can imagine. Yeah. I, I, I feel very useless when it comes to, to like, I own a home and I can't fix shit around here. It's <laughs> awful. I got to come know, down I, I just, there. I can't do anything. Yeah. Oh, I'm horrible yeah, at it. I need to yeah, come down I, there. We've got a leaky window, a leaky roof. It's yeah. It's not, it's not for me. Home ownership was a bad idea for me because I can't. Uh, sure. The, the idea of cutting wood <laughs> and making it fit in the right place on a just blows my mind. Right. And to that is a that is a beyond skill to oh, me. Yeah. And I'm in awe of construction. Man, it was such an amazing education for me. And it was bigger. It was I think it was the first time in my life where I really started to rub shoulders. I had rubbed shoulders before with people. You know, I you know I grew up in the in the in the rural south. Um was around a lot of and and had a lot of black friends in high school. But I was still blinded somewhat to just their experience and and who they were. Yeah. Um, and and then when I went to college, I was just in this university that was full of just a bunch of middle class, upper class white kids. Um, but then did the young life thing in literally middle upper class uh, Atlanta, suburban Atlanta. And then I took this job where I was swinging a hammer. So I was also I was a Spanish minor in college. So I spoke Spanish and that's what helped me get the building job. Um, and then all of a sudden yeah. I'm spending the majority of my day with, um, legal and illegal, um, workers from Mexico, Guatemala, all these amazing places. I could speak their language and I was beginning to understand their lives. And it was just a new door started up and opening up to me. It's like, Oh, wait a yeah. minute. There's, there's there's a world out there that's very different. People's experiences are very different. And I was just blown away too at their incredible skill. Just like you said, it's like these guys had unbelievable skills um, that they taught me. Um, I think they were super appreciative that I would I wanted to speak their language. They loved that. So they began to trust me and they were teaching me a lot of great things about building. So one of the one of the most formative years for me, just in terms of professionally, um, and I've had a lot of great professional years, but that was one that was real significant. And as I, as I left that world in terms of that being my sole job and I went into the fire service, I still use those skills all the time, moonlighting on the side. Yeah. And, I bet. Yeah. yeah. And those have been wonderful ways to make side income and just to keep my house dry and keep things, you know, tip top, yeah. which has been nice. So, uh, yeah, so yeah. I did that. Oh, I'm so jealous of that. That's <laughs> amazing. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I grew up, I, I did some roofing and I helped, my dad was a painter. I helped him do stuff, Yeah, but none of it stuck at all. None of it, you know, but if you put me in front of a computer, you got I would pick up anything and I could take apart electronics. I love that. But see, I don't know if it's wood that I hate or if it's, I don't know. The way that you feel about, you know, wood, woodworking, that whole world is the exact way I feel inside when I think about computer parts or 
Yeah. Um, it's, it, it is just a world that I do not like. I think you made a post recently. Yeah. I saw of uh, a PlayStation you completely rebuilt, and I'm looking at that amazed, yeah. Matt. I mean, I'm just. Oh no, that's super dude, easy to me. <laughs> I'm looking at so oh, easy. Matt. I'm looking. I'm, I'm just so impressed. I'm like, holy smokes! I would just throw the thing in the trash. I would have no idea yeah. what to do. Um. So I can. To- I totally feel that space. Uh. Just in a different context. Yeah. So so yeah, I did that. Um. And then my wife and I, we we wanted to get out of the Atlanta area. Just, everything just felt too too fast. And I know you understand the hot and humidity for us. Even my wife's from Minnesota, oh, yeah. which is pretty hot and humid in its own ways. Oh. But and we just spent a lot of times in the mountains. I grew up right at the base of the apps in upstate South Carolina. We were always in the mountains or foothills, always in the mountains playing. And we said, hey, let's just get close to Asheville. So that would have been wow, 19 years ago now. We came into Western North Carolina, petered around for a bit, and then ultimately landed in a little town just east of Asheville called Black Mountain, which now the town's become pretty bougie. It wasn't when we got here. It was still just kind of a little secret little mountain town full of just a lot of local people. But what COVID did to the world, particularly just the exposure we got. There were so many people from the East Coast that nobody was getting on planes, but they would get in a car and drive. And a couple of articles were written about the town in Southern Living Magazine and Travel and Leisure. And then we just had this huge influx, which has changed the landscape. And and that's been good and bad. Oh. And you know, any type of growth has its positives yeah. and its negatives. But that's where we are, and we're here, and and we love it. And and our, our kids. This is their community. They're true Black Mountaineers, born and raised here. And it's interesting, uh, even even for them. And I love this about their experience. You know, they go to school with a huge variety of people, from you know rich white people to very poor Appalachian mountain white people, um, which is a mm-hmm. very different you know people. And then we have a significantly large Hispanic community, which I love. Um, also in our school district. So you know, our kids play soccer with other players that their native you know, language is Spanish, Spanish. And I love that our kids are around a lot of native Spanish speakers and they, they play sports and do school with, you know, with that. And I think that's really great. So um, that's kind of got us to, that's what got us to North Carolina. Man, I'm trying to wrap this up real quick and we can kind of get some more meat and potatoes of spirituality, but, um, <laughs> yep. Got here, uh, bumbled around. We had a surprise pregnancy, which, which is our daughter. I was doing some construction work and I was doing a little bit of media work. I can't build computers, but I, I was able to, I was doing a lot of um, like video and film work, uh, making ends meet. We had this surprise pregnancy. My wife was a school teacher. And the question was, well, um, we're, had this beautiful baby coming. We're excited, but we got to figure some things out financially because my job was kind of feast or famine. And she wanted the ability to be, to be home at least those first, those first formative years of the baby. So I literally went to a real estate uh, meeting, kind of a, kind of a under the table, just, just a group of guys, a real a kind of real estate investors that just kind of look for depressed properties to purchase and fix them up because of my skill set. I thought I could kind of do that. And had a little bit of money to invest. And I went to this meeting, bumped into an old buddy from an old church that I had gone to. And we started talking and he was asking about Erica and I thought about the pregnancy. And he's like, dude, you ever thought of becoming a firefighter? And uh, I was like, yeah. When I was like six years old, I thought that'd be kind of a cool thing to do. And he said, man, you got to look into it. So I came home from the meeting and I told Eric, I bumped into Wayne and, oh, how's he doing? Great, great. And, I, and she said, well, did you see find any properties? I said, no, but I think I'm going to apply to the Asheville Fire Department. And she just burst, she just burst out laughing. She was like, what are you talking about? And to her, it was, you know, that's what all the little, that's what, you know, military, police, fire, you know, that's, are you resorting back to this weird childhood thing right now? Because you feel pressure, you know, (laughs) but got into it and went through an entire academy and came out of the academy. And when we were being kind of commissioned into the department, the chief of the department got up and he said one thing I'll never forget. He started the whole thing about you are now entering into a career where your job is to enter into the worst day of someone's life and make a difference. Wow. And when he said that, wow. I thought I'm all in. I'm like, I'm all in. 
That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You've, I was going to do this just to make ends meet for a few years and figure some other stuff out. And I think I'm going to stick through it. And that was 15 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's cool. I, I would have burst out crying if he would have said that to me because I, it made me well up. Yeah. It made, I'm oh, a, yeah. I'm a softie. I, yeah. Same. <laughs> I mean, I remember my, my heart just swell when he said that. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's an immense responsibility and an honor as well. And in, in such a way to be that first line of defense Absolutely. for someone for their life. Yeah. You and know. being a follower of Jesus, it just felt really real. I just coming out of a ministry yeah. where I was like, man, just get people to believe the right thing, which I was becoming suspect yeah. of a little bit. And then getting the fire service yeah. and it was like, yeah. do the right thing. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, I like that. And then, you know, this will probably launch into where we're heading, but getting into the fire service and then being exposed to so much suffering so quickly was a yeah. huge jolt for me that took me on a, a very different journey so that i wasn't expecting yeah so so that is a, a career i i absolutely could not handle hmm. i'm certain of I, I don't do well with gore i don't do well with anything e extreme like you've probably seen i can't imagine sure. uh and i don't want to you know right it's it's just a i can't believe people can do that for a living hmm. And I can't believe it. it's just incredible. It's hard to even define to hmm. me. Uh, and some of some of the friends I have here locally are are EMS guys, so a very similar feeling. Oh, yeah. you know, they they're going into the very worst moment of someone's life For sure. and staying calm mm -hmm. and being supportive and just doing so much ministry. Yes. Precisely that it's uh and don't and don't even realize it probably that it's such a that it is such a mm -hmm. ministry to be that person mm -hmm. just to be a calm presence yes. that knows more than anybody else in the room for a moment is an amazing yes. uh gift to yes. people. well thank so, you for saying that and you know we all have our different gifts you know the things that we can yeah. experience and hold and stomach things that we can't um, we're all in different places. And I think that's just the beauty of humanity and the beauty of community is that we're all bringing things to the table. So yeah. thank you for, uh, being grateful for our, for ours. So it means a lot. <laughs> yeah. So what is your, I know you've, you mentioned in a text, not just a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. before we got on here, you, you said something about agnostic. Yeah. What, what did you say? My you're, evolving you're agnosticism. Slide into agnosticism. Okay. My evolving agnosticism. Yeah, um, <laughs> so I, I have a friend who wrote a piece several, several years ago about Christian agnosticism mm. that, one, was incredibly well yeah. done. But I was not familiar with the concept. It, it hit me in a way that I just, my mind couldn't handle it. Interesting. Time. But today, I feel very much in line with that. Mm, very much. Interesting. But I caught, but I'm more in the Christian atheist thing because I just lack the belief yes. and the knowledge. So I'm kind of both. Um, and you, you mentioned that. So I'm curious to know where are you? Mm -hmm. Where are you coming from as far as, you know, the evolution of your fundamentalism and mm -hmm. your, your PCA past mm -hmm. and these kind of semi evangelical circles? Yeah. Uh, where are you today and how did you? kind of come out of that yeah big question um sorry no it's 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 definitely where we we, we both knew this is where we're going to jump into <laughs> good question so for me going back to kind of how i i just kind of closed as far as being a firefighter and being exposed to so much suffering i I began to ask a lot of questions because I felt like my experience was not matching the theology I had been given. I felt like that the nice, neat answers that the church had given me to navigate suffering just wasn't cutting it anymore. And I began to ask, I think even coming out of that, the Calvinistic, well, you're elect, you're, you're special. <laughs> Let's just use that yeah. word. You're special. I was seeing a lot of people suffer 
who I thought they were special. You know, they were special people. They were people that love Jesus. And I'm like, okay. So my experience isn't matching up with kind of what I was given and life is hard. And, and what does the scripture have to say about that? I think, well, I know for four years from the, you know, the first shift on the rig to a very significant injury that happened in my life, it was cumulatively building up in me these questions and this curiosity and this, I'm just not so sure, but I was ignoring it because it was not at that time even though I was seeing it and a level, a level of empathy that I had was processing some of it. I would go to church on Sunday and almost get, I don't know if brainwashed is the word I would use, but maybe indoctrinated at some level out of it. Oh yeah. 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 Kind of reinvigorated. Yeah. Kind of like that internal revival. Yep. You know, and it was just like, oh yeah, yeah. That's what they did. That's what they did to us when they took us to. We had a thing called Super Wow that we went to as youth. Okay. And it every year, you know, you once you're going back to school, all the kids that went are just on fire for Jesus. Right. And it's this. Yeah. It's this. They. It's this reinforcement over the summer. Yep. And uh, it fades. You see it fade. But I was the kid that it didn't fade for. Right. So anyway, yeah, go ahead. yeah. yeah. So when I uh, fast forward from that first shift and a lot of the very traumatic things that I had experienced and seen and then landing into 2013, I, being a mountain guy, being an outdoor guy I, at the time was really uh, spending a lot of time mountain biking. And we have very, very steep, fast trails here with the, with the highest peaks uh, in the entire range from Georgia to Maine. And I have I had a very violent mountain biking accident. So violent, in fact, that I broke my neck. Um, my my C six or my C seven snapped. Um, I was insanely fortunate that it, I didn't have any permanent spinal damage as far as my spinal cord at all. Um, I was paralyzed momentarily for a bit when the accident first occurred. And the only thing residual that I have from that accident is I can't feel temperature on my right leg which is kind of weird, but other, other than I can feel wow. touch, I just can't feel temperature. But other than that, full recovery. But it was in that moment. So two things happened in 2013. The first was even before that wreck, I was diagnosed with adult onset type one diabetes, which is normally what kids get, get. So rather than most diabetics, the majority of diabetics are type two, which can be driven by lots of different factors. But the idea is your body's making insulin. It's just resistant to it. Type 1 is your beta cells in your pancreas are no longer making insulin. So you have to, you have to put synthetic insulin in to survive. It's just a, it's a lot higher maintenance form of diabetes. And I manage it in a very alternative way that's kept me super healthy. Whenever I go to the doctor and they take my blood, they're like, your blood work says you don't have it. But we know if you started eating differently and doing life differently, it would flare. So um, I'm real thankful <clears throat> that I was able to get under control real quick. And and I'm always looking more alternative ways to do it. And you know my personality well enough now. I don't. I'm always skeptical of the masses and the status quo. Yeah. So uh, found an alternative way through a brilliant endocrinologist out of New York to manage. And, and I remember thinking when that happened, I was like, oh, this is a bummer, you know, but it was kind of like that. All the questions I was asking about suffering, I was like, well, this is kind of a significant suffering for myself. And I'm kind of feeling something kind of significant. But I just kind of attributed it. I mean, literally, man, you're going to laugh. I just attributed it to God, you know, and it's pretty selfish to even say this. It's like, well, God, God gave me this. I'm so special. Like, I got this diabetes so that I can help other people with diabetes. He gave me this so that I can conquer it, you know. Which man, that's that's the, that's the opposite coin of prosperity gospel. It's, it's yeah, it's, 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 yeah. It's that I I am so special that he's actually he can he can he's allowed me to suffer because I can. You know, he gave me this, and that, you can handle, can it. handle it. And I was kind of in that mindset, sorta uh, managing it. I got diagnosed in June, and then come October, so four months after, violent mountain biking crash, neck broke like weak in the hospital full-on spinal surgery came out was told you may never ride a fire truck again 
which felt devastating to me. And at that point, the gloves were off. I'm like, okay. Um, my experience of watching other people suffering isn't matching the faith I've carried. And then my experience right now is completely different than the faith that I've carried at that point for you know, 12, 13 years. And the gloves came off, and it was a full-on, this is what I really think. Um, and, and I was coming from it from that you, 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 you could have prevented this. You caused that. I was pissed. I was very angry. Was this internal or were you expressing this? I was expressing to it other, people. other people. So it was definitely internal, but I was also expressing it to my wife, who's just this amazing person. And she was going through her own evolution that was different than mine, but she is just this amazing soul that can just carry. She's so empathetic and just can carry so much. And she just gave me the freedom just to let it loose. Um, I didn't go in front of my church and stand up and say, this is, you know, I didn't, I wasn't that public, but um, I was very honest in social settings. This is what I'm dealing with. This is what I'm struggling with. And for the first time, it gave me the permission. There were certain books that I was just afraid to read because my conservative evangelical community says, you know, those are no-no books. You shouldn't, you know, there's, yeah. there's, you don't read those kind of books. Th those are dangerous books. Um, yeah. Almost like, you no, know, don't be around gay people. You, you, you know, you hang around gay people, yeah. you might, you, you might, might catch it. it. Yeah. R ridiculous. Ridiculous. So what were the books? So what? my first dive is I dove into some Greg Boyd books. Boyd's a, a progressive evangelical pastor out of St. Paul, a personal friend of my father-in-law. So those are the first books. Oh. Um, I got in introduced in open theism, which was like, whoa, yeah. like, oh. And then to even read, like, wait a minute, there's actually, and I was still an inerrant, inerrancy guy at the time. I was like, whoa, there's actually decent scriptural arguments being made for this open theist position. Yeah. And then from there, I pushed into... Thomas Merton, I pushed into Richard Rohr, I pushed into Pete Enns. Um, I wish that these are names that I had known mm, at, whenever I had my crisis, yeah. because it, that would have been a, a something nice to approach right. for my fundamentalist brain. Yes. It would have been a better transition. Yes. For me, it was a good slide. It felt like it was a slide rather than just a free yes. fall. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's a really... That's I love hearing you say that. That makes a lot of sense. I feel like if I didn't have those guys, it would have been a very different experience for me. Uh, and I would have been okay either way, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. So I had these books I was digesting and working through, and my faith began to shift incredibly quickly from a place of you know, previous eternal torment and election and to the deep, benevolent universe, the love of God, to a universal sense of salvation and love and redemption. And it made sense. And it also felt like it was mirroring the experience I was having at that time as well. So I went, I would say that was my deconstruction. That was the beginning of it. Uh, Erica, my wife, had already been through it um, before me. And which was just so wonderful too, because as I was going through it, she already had the small library of books just to hand to me. Like, I think you might find this interesting or yeah. she, she was the one that wow. brought me Boyd's book and said, Hey, I think this may be helpful if you want to read it. Not, I'm not an asshole. Like read this, you know, this is going to solve all your problems. Yeah. But if yeah. you want, and uh, just with her patience and just beautiful spirit. So, um, yeah, I started digesting these things, and it brought me to these new spaces. Now, that being said, <laughs> um, I use the word re-evangelical often, and what I, okay. what I mean by that is my ideology was changing, but my psychology wasn't changing. So I was changing the way I thought about things, but I was still kind of an asshole inside. Like my deconstruction, I was very angry. And I think that's necessary and okay. I think that's part of the that's part of the journey. Yeah. You need to go through that. I, I was so bad. I was really, 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 really angry. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. it, 
if you went through some of my old old stuff, you'd just be like, "Wow, who is this?" Guy? Yeah, and I've he, I've looked at some of your your stuff on your your website. Um, I think when we first met, and and I could see it, you know, I could see it and smell it, but yeah, it's beautiful at the same, you know, it's just part of the journey, and we got to go through it. Yeah, and um, so I love that you understand where I'm coming from when I say that, and and I have a lot of friends now that are in these deconstructives. They're entering into it, and they are pissed. Like, and I don't try to talk them out of their anger. I just, I'm like, no, you got to have, let it fly. I think it's important. Let it fly. And so that's where I was. I'm getting very angry. And that term re evangelical, what I mean is, you know, my theology, my ideology was different. But just like I, I, I was still in a space of, but I'm right. Like, I was wrong before. Now I got this new, this new way of thinking and um and i am right about this new way of thinking this is where i use the whole re-evangelical i'm I'm the same way about everything it's like you never really grew you just changed your mind on the way on different on the way things look on the way that people believe something that really is just faith you know so Spent a few years in those spaces and was learning a lot. Just felt so freeing to read the no-no books. Uh, Really, just a lot of growth and my anger began to soften. The word that a lot of folks would use is reconstruction. I don't know if I would use that. Yeah, I've seen that in some places. I just found, and I've heard you say this recently, just co-hosting together that you're just getting into softer spaces and more yeah. inclusive spaces. And that's definitely been my experience too. It's, I just, even though I can still get chippy about certain things in my heart, um, I'm just way more gracious than I was three, four years ago when I was just so angry and so bitter. I, of course, COVID was so weird. Right before COVID, for the first time, I'd been to church in a while. For the first time, I said, "I want to. I'm going to go to church." And I went to an Episcopal church here in our town. Just a beautiful community, lovely uh, priest. She's wonderful. And I went to. They have a. Um, it's just called the spoken word service. There's no music, which I really appreciated because I have a very tumultuous relationship with church music. Which is a whole other I do yeah, too. Whole other conversation from yeah. another uh, episode or uh, one yeah. day. But I was explaining that I saw it yesterday. I, what are you explaining what? Um, I was I was explaining that to uh, a young guy yesterday who was having a worship service thing like at the local theater. Mm. They're like doing live music and stuff, and he needed my help with something, so I went to help him, and he invited me, and I was like, PTSD. Yeah, totally, you know? that's me. <laughs> Oh uh, man! Uh-uh. Oh, I get it. I mean, um, <laughs> you you don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, I this 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 would anger half the you know half the world. But I, I hear a tune or two from Hillsong, and I'm like, I mean, I got to counter that with some Rage Against the Machine, uh-uh. bro. Like, no, uh, yeah, I got to get away. From I got to get shit. it out of my head. I, I need to <laughs> I get into do some dark spaces here just to get that out. Yeah, even those dark spaces that I got to get into feel lighter to me from the dark space than what I. Yes, one hundred percent. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so with you. Oh, man. Uh, oh, yeah. So I struggle with it. Yeah, yeah. Big time. Same. So when I heard that there was a service that had zero music, I'm like, that sounds cool. I'm in. I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. Walked into this 8 a.m. in the morning. Uh, and I'm a morning guy, so it was great. And I went alone. Uh, the sanctuary was, was you know, maybe, maybe, I wouldn't say a tenth full, but maybe 50 people there at best. And kind of, I, I grew up in a man. I grew up in the evangelical Protestant world. I don't know this up and down and say things and when they bow and I don't know any of this. But I'm just trying to keep up. Yeah. And it'd probably been hilarious if somebody was actually watching me, just kind of looking around to get, get my cues. But what I loved about the service is that rather than the service orbiting a person or a sermon, it orbited the Eucharist. Everything orbited um, communion and this idea of yeah. let's reflect on, for me, 
a radical brown man that was killed by empire to show love to the world. And I'm like, Amen. Wow. okay, I can get on board with this. And, and this was, this was at what sort of Episcopal. congregation? This was an Episcopal congregation. Okay. I think I missed yeah. that. Okay. So, wow. um, the Eucharist began and the way that they practiced it in this service is you come to the front and the priest serves you. There was a gentleman that was sitting there. Uh, he was blind. And he had a German shepherd seeing eye dog with him. He had a disability. Uh, and I was just real intrigued by the guy. He came in a little bit late with his dog and sat in a service dog. Well, because I was so, I was literally watching cues from everybody. When we walked to the front to take the Eucharist, I was like the last person to walk up because I just wanted to make sure I didn't do something stupid. You know, it looked like a ding dong in front of, you know, 50 people. Mm-hmm. So I'm watching them all take the Eucharist. Well, I'm standing there. And I'm just really moved. And I feel this hand hand touch my shoulder. And I turn around. And this this blind man. Um, and I, I don't know how blind he is. But obviously legally blind. And he just leaned in. And all he said was, welcome to our table, brother. And that was it. Oh, and I, lo- I lost it. Fine. I just lost it. And participated, went back the next week. Erica came back with me soon after that. This was literally right before COVID really hit. We went to, what did we go to? We didn't, uh, we went to Ash, Ash Wednesday. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Went to Ash Wednesday service right before Easter. Had to work Easter weekend, so I couldn't go to that. COVID hit and that was it. And we just, weren't connected to the congregation anymore because of COVID, but we were, we would jump in and, and, and watch online services. They were very protective of their congregation. Unlike a lot of churches that were like, you know, screw masks and screw this and let's all get in here and, you know, pass a virus, yeah. you know, uh, amongst one another. God will protect us. I heard that a lot. You know, God will protect us. Of course, they all ended up sick or some on respirators uh but uh yeah so that was for me a place where i think i began to if reconstruct is the word to use i began to soften and i was like okay um i just experienced such a beautiful image of grace with these people and i need to have that for myself and have that for my friends and community that are in that that place. Richard Rohr, who I referenced earlier, he talks about um, three boxes. There's three boxes of growth, and one is construction, then deconstruction, and then reconstruction. And yeah. he said that's just a ne- that's just a, a necessary order to be to be a healthy person. And we're yeah, yeah. Okay. and when we're young we're given that which I was given so well from my parents, a, a box. It was that construction that I was in and suffering in my life, observing the suffering of others and going through my own shattered that box. I did the deconstructing deconstruction thing. I you know graduated really quick to the second box and sat in that box for a while and got to a point where I was like, this is a dark box. Um, I needed it. This is important. Um, this is part of the journey. But I can't, I don't want to live here long term. I, I need I need something much more sustainable. And that service in that Episcopal church was a turning point to start getting out. And that being said, I'll be honest, right where I'm at, I feel like I jump back and forth between that second and third box all the time, depending on how resourced I am, how rested, how well fed, just, you know, how I'm doing, how my family's doing. Yeah. So, um, that's where I, at that point, that was kind of getting me to these much healthier spaces. And then in 2001, Erica was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer. And that was a journey that none of us were expecting, particularly this young. Um, she was, I was. I had just turned 40. She was, she's a year older than me. So she was 41 or 40, early forties. 
And I am still, Matt, um, unpacking that whole experience. Still living. We're still in it. Every scan, we're still in it. Every time she gets scanned. Yeah. And I have evolved at this point where I'm probably more agnostic than ever. Um, a lot of people, I guess, I guess they, and that's a little aside, we had the craziest things said to us when she was, when she was going through her cancer treatments from well-meaning people. And I share this on your podcast. Hopefully this will be helpful for someone listening. I had a good friend who lost his mom really early, really young. And he told me, he was like, dude, he said, you wouldn't believe the bullshit people told us when my mom died. It was, it was so awful. But where we got to is, this, is what they're trying to say to us, but they're not saying it well, is we love you. We love you. And, and we're yeah. here. They just say it in these horrible ways that's very warped and damaging. And we just have to let that go by us and say, what they need to do is just sit here with us, be quiet with us, grieve with us. That's what we need. And so they open their mouths and they say stupid shit. But yeah, the silence is 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 difficult. It is. It's very difficult. But, yeah, uh, but so necessary. You know, in in Judaism, yes. the one of the yeah, uh, yes. saying Shiva. It, it's yeah. I think I think that's the thing we should bring into the rest of the culture. I think it's just having a mm -hmm. presence is, is sometimes all you need. Um, so true. And that's, that's something. And you don't, you don't have to talk. And it's so much more effective, but I don't use the word effective. It's just so much more meaningful. I've learned so similar with the Shiva. I, I, I do that. So if I have a yeah, friend that's, Whatever it may be, a cancer diagnosis. I had a buddy uh, in the fire department, very young, got a cancer diagnosis. And I would drive an hour. He'd live deep in the mountains. And I would just drive to his bedside and sit there. That was it. I would just sit with Will. And we would maybe talk for 10 minutes. And then I would just sit there for 30 and hold his hand. And sometimes he would cry. And I'd cry with him. And the last time I saw him, I spent the last 15 minutes in the bed with him. I mean, he's just frail little guy at the time he probably weighed 60 yeah. pounds and i just laid in bed with him got him under covers and we just sat there said didn't say a word and we would laugh and and weep and yeah there's just real power in that um real power so yeah. i'm with you brother uh, i i i do a lot of that in the context of uh people grieving god mm, um, so good and it's yeah, it's an important thing, I think. I think it's a, a missing mm -hmm. aspect. Um, when you go through like the deconstruction process and you come out the other end without mm -hmm. belief, I don't think people will really give you space for the grief that, that is mm -hmm. inevitable. I don't see that addressed very mm -hmm. often. I see people talk about the trauma. I see people talk about, you know, uh, rage learning and trying to understand all the things they didn't understand before right. and like really read every book you can yeah. find. Um, I see a lot of that, but I don't see a lot talked about with mm. grief. And that's what I've kind of always focused on is the grief yes. side of it. Cause that's, I was grieved. It, it, it still does. It still is, is, uh, kind of the, the subject of most of my grief. What um, a ministry too for you so, uh, to recognize that and practice yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. It's uh I mean it's meaningful work to me. It's, it's very meaningful. And it's mm -hmm. hard to describe too. Like what does that entail? A lot of times it's just talking yeah, and shutting yeah. up. It's that's right. one of the Le two. Learning that balance. <laughs> and yeah. I think for me realizing that I just need to shut up ninety percent of the time. And I yeah. ask questions yeah. more. When I open my mouth, you know questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, and I do a lot of those dialogues with people, and it sometimes for yeah. years it's a, and it does make a difference. I think and it makes a difference for me too. I guess yes, it's absolutely that's that's so, the beauty of it. I think. Yeah, I think that's why I have such a, a an understanding of this process is because I've just heard people talk about the like you were talking about mm -hmm. kids 
being so inconvenient, saying the things that you're not supposed to say. Like a lot of people have said those things to me for the very first time. Mm. Like the very first time you say out loud that you don't believe in God is terrifying. Yes. <laughs> it's, it, it's immense. Uh-huh. Um, and the fan, that's an honor to, to hear oh, that yeah. from people. Anyway, I'm getting no, emotional. and you should, and you should. It, it's a death, and and deaths yeah. are emotional things that should be. They should be. It's a sacred moment. It's just a sacred moment. Whether it's an ideological death, a religious death, physical death, relational death, it's a, it's a, it's a profound moment. So, man, I love that. Uh, so good. Um, gosh, where were we? Uh, well, you're more agnostic yeah, than ever. Yeah. So, going on that journey with Erica, and and just for the listener, she's doing incredibly well. And this is and Good, this yeah. is uh, something I think is really important to say too. We had a lot of people praying for us. We were praying the best we knew how. But at the you know I use the phrase get in the balcony, like in the balcony view, getting in the balcony and looking down the balcony view. It's so wonderful that Erica was had such a I mean she had a complete response to chemotherapy. Amazing, she. We found out even after that, it was like, yeah, she didn't have a complete response. It was a palliative path until she passed, which we didn't understand wow. that at the time. It's like, oh my gosh. Like, we just thought it was yeah. just going to be, well, you know, chemotherapy, surgery. We, we carry on. They're like, no, if she, if she didn't have a complete response, we weren't going to be doing anything major to her. She had a complete response. And then it was the surgeries and the recovery and all that. So it's been a long journey. And we couldn't be more grateful. That said, I know so many people, good people, that prayed the exact same prayers we prayed, that wanted the exact same things from the goodness of their heart, and they didn't get it mapped. Like, they passed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for me, I have to be honest and say, was it divine intervention? And if it was, why did we get it and they didn't? Because I don't believe God plays favorites. I don't do that bullshit anymore. Or is it just really good medicine? <laughs> and the fact yeah. that Erica is in excellent shape and takes such good care of herself. And I mean, she did so many alternative things with the chemotherapy, you know, dove into turkey tail mushrooms and got such good rest. And we did so many things psychologically to give her things to look forward to in the future. Did, did we just scientifically just do it in a way that worked? And my my bend is that's what we did. <laughs> yeah, I um, think you exactly. did. Exactly. Um, that's just that's the spot I'm in, and and that's that's where I am. And and I think that that has moved us even down from at least me a slope of you know it's great religion just or is healthy spirituality just great psychology, and that's it. Yeah. And I'm not afraid of a dirt nap I don't anymore. Know. You know, I'm not afraid of it not being real. Um, but I also have said this, and I do believe this. If I get on my deathbed and I'm told it's not literally true, my answer would be, I'm not surprised. But it <laughs> still is true. It may not have literally been true. Yeah. But at some measure, it did give me an incredibly, it wasn't perfect, but a following Jesus was a very incredibly healthy context for me to, to to live in. And I would do some things different, but I'd follow them again. You know, I've had to do it all over again. So it may not be literally true, but it doesn't mean that it can't still be true. And, and pressing yeah. into, particularly for me recently, I've gotten real into the data gene and, and moving into Eastern texts. And I'm just seeing the parallels. What I would say in you know mystic Christianity, not the not the evangelical you know politician we won't speak of, not not that whole weird movement, the Calvinist <laughs> movement, but Jesus at Jesus' core, which yeah. I know you I know you know what I mean when I say that. The core of this oh, radical, yeah. um, brilliant teacher. Um man, these guys are all saying the same shit. And and I love it, and it's really helpful. And yeah, yeah, 
Go ahead. I feel like you want to interject. I'm, I'm kind of in the same, I'm in the same place. Um, you know, I, I read the Quran when I was like 13 or 14 and I read the Bible incessantly from that time on until I was probably mm-hmm. 20. And when I read the Quran, I was like, wow, this doesn't feel that different. And if I'm really honest, the other one's more violent. Right. Yeah. I'm really honest. This guy sounds a little better. Mm-hmm. Just a little, yep. not perfect. Sounds a little better. <laughs> and that's and that's so true with so many different religious texts that I today, if you I would kind of say very similar to what you're saying. Today, I would say I think the Bible and I think holy texts are the best effort we can do at the time that we're doing it to explain yes. the world through the lenses that we have, through all of our biases, all of our bullshit, it is the good, the bad, and the ugly yes. of humanity, sometimes mis- misattributed as divine. Yes. But that, that story, that human story, is the divine thing to me. And that, that is why the, the Bible is such a valuable book, because it is telling it a is. human story. It is. And that is, and and it's a universal human story that everyone can get Precisely. something out. Of. It's part of the human experience, and and to now, the credit of the Jewish people, to collect those writings, to put them in a library, and to just show the world these are our failures, these are our successes. Um, true. Thank yeah. you, like thank you for for doing that, and. And for me, the text to me is also an evolution. And I, I said this recently in, in the podcast, you know, um, in Pastoral No Answers. For me, it's, it's, not a, it, it's a book of the evolution of human consciousness and, under, and their understanding of God. And so much stuff gets attributed to God in the Old Testament. You know, I said, my hermeneutics, Jesus. When I'm in these places of, of faith, my hermeneutics, Jesus, if it, if it doesn't, and that takes a measure of faith, if it doesn't align with the person of Jesus, then I don't think whatever was written in the Old Testament is really God. I think, you know, Abraham came from a yeah. culture where they sacrificed kids all the time. Like, that was normal. Yeah. So, of course, it would be written, God told us to sacrifice Isaac. And then we had this giant step forward where God intervenes and goes, I don't think you need to do that anymore. <laughs> like, stop, please. Please stop. But there's confusion yeah. as to well, who was the voice of God, who wasn't. Anyway, for me, um, I don't necessarily need for it to be literally true or not. And, and I know that that's a, a gray area that a lot of people struggle with. It's just where I've landed. And there are days where I, I do feel faithful. And there are days where I feel super agnostic and that is just, that is just me. And who knows where my journey will go on from here. If I'll get more agnostic to a place of atheism or if I'll become more deeply connected into faith and, and a belief in, uh, in the divine. But um, what I know right here and right now is that we are in a world that is on fire, that is, what I would define as, as hell, hellacious. And we have great teachers, Jesus being one of them, that is pointing to an alternative way to live, to make things better for the least of these, for the poor, for the marginalized, for the minorities. And that's what I want to be about. And if I get on the other side and it's, it's literally true, great. And if I get on my deathbed and it's not, I still, I still feel like I participated in a great work and I'm grateful. So, yeah. Yeah. That's Thanks. beautiful, Hayden. Well, I think the same's true of you. Well, well thank you. <laughs> yeah. I uh the way I approach the whole thing has changed so considerably yeah. now that um my reverence for the Bible and for the person of Jesus feels much deeper mm. than I ever did because I see it for what I think it really is, for this this human work, this mm-hmm. human attempt to do what what is really and truly yes. beyond us, um, to understand something so big yes. as this that what yeah. we're in, and uh, you know, it explains why we commit atrocities. It explains uh, why we stop committing atrocities. It it explains so many things about our evolution. 
and all of all of these books do mm-hmm. all of these texts do that in some way yes. um that it's it's hard not to see this uh beautiful humanity yeah. in it precisely i want to ask you a question and it started it was in my mind when we were just kind of talking earlier before we got kind of to my story and i think i heard you correctly but it kind of uh, glitched out so i want to make sure but I feel like you you mentioned you used the phrase Christian agnosticism, which I used earlier, and that that was intriguing to you. That was something to you that was that kind of tickled your imagination a bit. Is that what you were saying? Unpack yeah, yeah. That. I'm I, really curious. I've kind of been in that in that realm for mm. some time, for a long yeah. time, really. Um, but I I kind of detached myself from the from the Christian belief so much. Um, and I would say today I'm, I practice a f- Christianity as I understand mm. it. Um, and I don't believe that that has anything, any bearing on what I believe mm. about God. That's beautiful. And I don't think that Jesus was really, I think Jesus was talking about God in the same sense that the Bible is talking about God. Yeah. And it is, this guy trying to connect to things he, he that yeah. are beyond him. Um, so, and I, I see the way that we are intended to approach humanity as if, if I treat you as if you are God, and if I treat the least of these as if they are God, then I am prioritizing mm. God's creation appropriately. Yeah. And that is more important than, than what I believe about God. And so what I do, it's yep. the practice. Preach. So, I love it. I mean, out of the words of Jesus yeah. <laughs> himself, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Yeah. He, he placed himself in that space. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we're we're in a world now that, like you said, is on fire. We're There are no less than four genocides happening right now on our planet. People are, are being slaughtered left and right, largely by the hand mm-hmm. of our own government. Um, or by mm-hmm. the weapons right. we produce and our policies. Directly or indirectly, yeah. So there's this, yeah, yeah, there's this, there's also this survivor's guilt for for being so safe mm-hmm. and comfortable and being able to to, to talk with a friend on a, uh, from a hundred, couple hundred miles away about, about yeah. God and our lives. And, uh, and I, I think, I think a lot of that is reflected in in the Jesus mm-hmm. I understand, um, and how we approach that is is reflected yep. in that man. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Well, I will let you if you have any closing words, or if you want to plug your socials or anything like that. Have you written a book yet? <laughs> I haven't, but I, I, <laughs> I. So I, I do have a working title. I don't consider myself to be a, yeah. a, a great writer, but I've been encouraged by some folks to do it. But um, because of what I do for a living and just other different things I've gleaned over time, uh, my working title is Don't Be a Dick, Leadership Lessons I've Learned from Firehouse to Fatherhood. Thanks, uh, man. Well, <laughs> that, that would, if it didn't have the word dick in there, the, the you could sell that at every Christian right. bookstore. So you might have to come up with yeah, a, a yeah. Christianese version. I, I'm, um, I'm definitely not looking also, for any uh, Christian big. audience here, but um, yeah, but yeah, I, I actually have even, even have an outline for. It. I don't know when it's going to start getting fully fully written. But nice. I've, I've been plugging away at it for at this point, you know, loose. When I say plugging, loosely plugging for a couple of years yeah. now. Just got a document that I'm just adding things to and things are here or there and um so yeah i uh that's that's been one book idea and the second one was my my son who's actually sitting here i don't even know if yeah, there, he's looking at me yeah, he, he sees me um he <laughs> turned uh 13 last may so he's about to turn 14 in a couple of weeks and i took him one of the things i told him is i said you when you turn 13 let's go on a big trip just the two of us so one of the cool things that we got to do is we we took off to the Outer Banks, um, same state. We're in North Carolina, but that's a really long state horizontally on the map. So it's, uh-huh. a, it's an eight hour drive for us to get from Asheville to Hatteras. So we took this really cool long journey together. Uh, we love the Outer Banks of so how wild it is and just the fishing off, off the chain. Had this amazing um, four or five days together fishing and, and just building huge fires on the beach and just having a blast. 
But each night uh, before we left, I asked a group of men who knew him, would you please write him a letter on what it means to become a healthy person, a healthy man? Um, and they did. It was beautiful. Wow. And each night I'd give him a couple of letters and he would read them. Um, but the last letter he got was a letter from me. And I've been encouraged by some family members that have seen it like, oh, man, you should take that letter and kind of dissect it down into, into a book maybe one day. So we'll see. Um, but those are some ideas I have. As far as social goes, socials, the only thing I do is Instagram. Yeah. So I'm not a big social media um, person. And a lot of that, I think, was very intentional. I was younger because I, I knew myself well enough to know I wouldn't handle it well. Um, and I'm at a place now where I'm just, I'm at I'm middle age. And I just, I don't know if I give a shit anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. I wouldn't have any of it if I didn't have right. a business because you really it's can't. Spot on. I get you, it. You it makes can't. total sense. But I, I wish I could divorce yeah, myself so from it. I do the Instagram thing. If people want to uh, find me, um, uh, my handle is Vado Griff, Vado, V A D O G R I S. G R I F F, maybe? Well, there's one F or two Fs and then Vado. Yeah. yeah. I'll link to it. I'll make sure. Which it's all that is to. is Latin for Vado's yeah. Go in Latin. So it just. It's Latin for go, Griff, go, because uh, we, uh, we are always on the move. We're always traveling and, and getting out and camping and trying to have adventures with friends and family. And so that's just the name of the, of the handle. So I don't post a lot, but uh, feel free to jump in if anybody wants to check it out. And that's all I got. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I look forward to the book. Oh, thank the books. you. <laughs> that's I think that would yeah. be great. I think uh, I think uh, you tell a good story. You're you're uh, good to listen oh, to. So I imagine you. you can write just as well. If you just use the same voice you're using, you'll get. Well, I'm there, a stream of conscious writer. Writing is. is hard. I struggle. Yeah, I am yeah. too. I, I it's a struggle for me to actually get it all out there and to get the train to slow down enough mm-hmm. to actually get the thought on yeah. paper. Um, uh, it's it's a real struggle, yeah. but. I think yeah, I think you'd be an interesting read. I appreciate read that. Buddies sure. of mine who are artists, be it musicians, uh, painters, <laughs> um, even filmmakers, they just say just just get stuff down. It doesn't have to be polished or clean. Just vomit it out. Yeah. Because once you get it visually on paper, then you can start to organize it. You know, and and I just yeah. need to do that. I sometimes I I get that vomit out and give it to someone else mm-hmm. and say, "Help me here." Or what does this make any sense right. at all? Or is it just my delusional brain right. you know, trying to make sense of a yep, concept? Yep. Um, well, I'll, I, I will leave on this note. Uh, the last guest of the podcast, Jamin Collier, just released a new book. Um, so I want to plug that real quick. Let me open. It's incredibly mm. good. And it's got the longest name. Uh, it's called "If I'm Really Honest: The Transparent Thought Life of a Reluctant Deconstructionist." Mm-hmm. Very good book. Um, so far, I've greatly enjoyed it. So I hope that you'll, uh, if you're listening, go check it out. If you and listen to his story as well. Um, he he actually released the book after that, so. You didn't get to plug it at the time, but I want to plug yeah. it now. I think uh, it's a really good piece of work, uh, and it describes uh, the process of deconstruction extremely well uh, and is, is talking to the church and the people he cares about in a way that is, that is uh, worth oh, listening to. But, beautiful. yeah, I will, I will leave uh, you guys with that. Hayne, thank you so much. I oh, greatly likewise. enjoyed this. Thank you for just letting me tell my story and give me that space. And I love you. And I'll see you next week or is it next week? I'll see you soon. I know that. Sometime. Yeah. We'll be, we'll be hosting or interviewing John yes. Pavlovic. Is that, I think that's right. right. Yeah. Um, okay. We'll have to confirm with him, but uh, on, on the pastor with no answers podcast, and we have, we questions. do, <laughs> we have questions and concerns. <laughs> Yeah, for <laughs> real. So, yeah, I look forward to that. Hopefully, this will be published before that. Sounds so, great. Uh, Hayne, thank you for joining me. Thanks, thank Matt. Thank you so buddy. much.